Hello, and welcome back to the Crime Reel. This week, we shall be looking at the many crimes of Peter Manwell, who was also known as the Beast of Birkenshaw. In 1923, a young couple by the names of Samuel Manwell and Bridget Greenan were married in Scotland. Samuel and Bridget both came from large Catholic families but as Bridget was already pregnant at the time of their marriage, they had a very small wedding attended by just two witnesses. Soon after, Samuel left heavily pregnant Bridget in Scotland whilst he went in search of a better life for them in New York. After the birth of their first son James, Bridget joined her husband in the US whilst leaving young James with her mother in Scotland. On the 15th of March 1927, approximately a year after arriving in the United States, Bridget gave birth to the couple's second son, a boy who they named Peter Thomas Anthony Manuel. Within two years, the stock market crash of 1929 had caused the US to be plunged into the Great Depression. The family persevered with their life in America, but eventually, after years of struggling to make ends meet, in 1932, they decided to return to live in Scotland. Peter was five years old when they returned, and went from living as an only child to having a big brother overnight. With a new addition to his family, new school and cultures to deal with, Peter struggled somewhat with the adjustment to his new life. When Peter was 10, Samuel and Bridget had a daughter who they named Teresa and shortly after the family decided to move to Coventry in England. Coventry had become a major centre of the British motor industry in the early 20th century so there were more jobs available. Both Peter and his brother James's behaviour became increasingly problematic as they got older. James was often in trouble with the police and had been sent away to an approved school, which was a boarding school for troubled children. Peter was an intelligent child who managed to obtain a scholarship at a well-respected local grammar school, but his wayward lifestyle soon got in the way of this. At the age of 11, he went into the church next to his school and stole the contents of the collection box. When he was just 12 years old, he was bound over for 12 months for breaking into a shop. Then, just a month after these conditions were put upon him, he was back in court again, charged with breaking and entering. At this point, like his brother before him, he was sentenced to serve time in an approved school. As part of this school transferal, a full medical was completed where he was shown to be in good health both physically and mentally. However, it was also noted that he was a constant liar, a ringleader who led others into trouble, deceitful and would blame others for his actions. He went on to be housed in at least four different approved schools after repeatedly absconding. Meanwhile, in November 1940, Coventry suffered severe bomb damage as part of the Coventry Blitz in World War II. During this bombing, the Manwells family home was destroyed and they returned to live in Motherwell, Scotland, leaving Peter at the approved school in Yorkshire where he was boarding at the time. Peter continued to run away to commit more crimes. In 1941, at the age of 14, Peter broke into a house a short distance from his school. He was caught by police having stolen a handbag. The lady who lived at the house was terrified when she saw him coming from her bedroom with an axe in his hand. Luckily, she was not harmed during the robbery. Peter continued to break the law. By the time he was 15, he had been charged with three more cases of breaking and entering. He was also charged with malicious bodily harm during the course of one of these robberies when he repeatedly struck a woman who had been asleep in her bed causing her to hemorrhage and suffer a severe concussion. Still only 15, he was also charged with the indecent assault of the wife of one of the school staff. 
He hit her over the head with a large stick, dragged her into the woods where he attempted to forcibly violate her. Peter was ultimately sent to Rochester Borstal Institution, an institution for young offenders, at the age of 16 after pleading guilty to robbery with violence. He was committed to stay there for two years. His time at Borstal was not without incident. At some point during 1944, he was struck on the forehead by a piece of steel from an air raid attack. He was knocked unconscious for several hours and continued to feel severely dazed for days after the accident. Later that year, he received a large electric shock in an accident that claimed the lives of three other people. Once again, he suffered from loss of consciousness as well as Burns. In 1945, at the age of 18, Peter was released and moved to Blackpool where he worked on a fairground stall. This didn't last long and he soon moved back up to Scotland. Within a year he had been arrested again, this time for breaking and entering and stealing a watch from someone's home. He was released on bail on the 21st of February 1946. Peter's crimes continued to escalate. On 3rd of March 1946, he attacked a young mother on a footpath in Mount Vernon, Glasgow. He brutally kicked and beat her before running away. Just four days later, he attacked and beat a nurse just six miles from the first attack. Luckily, a passing motorcyclist disturbed the attack, but Peter managed to run away. The following day, he attacked a 26-year-old lady after she got off a bus on Fallside Road, Bothwell, and made her way along Ferry Road. Peter attacked her from behind and repeatedly banged her head against the floor. He then forced her to a quiet railway embankment where he sexually assaulted her before making his escape. The lady was able to give a description of Peter, and the day after this attack, he was arrested and charged. Peter was also identified by the victims of the two earlier attacks. Despite this, he was only charged with the last offence. On the 21st of March 1946, he was sentenced to 12 months in prison for 15 previous charges of breaking and entering, and then he was convicted for the 8th of March attack and received an additional term of 8 years in prison. Had Peter been charged with all three of the attacks, he may have been given a longer sentence. He contested that the charges had been trumped up by the police and that the police had manufactured evidence in order to convict him. After serving just six years of this sentence, he was released from prison in October 1952. He got a job with the British Railways where he worked for about two years. After it came to light that he had been to prison, he was fired from his job and started to work alongside his father at the gasworks in East Kilbride. Peter met a young lady by the name of Anna O'Hara in 1954. It would seem that he was well liked by her family and he treated Anna well. On the 20th of May 1955, they got engaged and set their wedding date for the 30th of July that same year. All indications were that Peter had turned over a new leaf and was now living a law-abiding life. However, this was soon about to change, which leads us to question what, if any, other crimes were committed during this dormant period in his life. In the lead-up to their wedding, Anna broke off their engagement. Some reports state that this was because of religious differences, whilst others believe that she found out about his criminal past. Whatever the reason, Peter did not take the news of this breakup well. That very same day of the breakup, Peter abducted 29 year old Mary McLaughlin. Mary was travelling home from a local dance at approximately 11 pm. She was just a few minutes from her home when Peter grabbed her holding a knife to her throat. He then made her climb over a fence into a nearby field where he continued to threaten her and sexually assault her. Eventually he let her go. Mary went to the police and Peter was once again charged. After deciding to represent himself in court, his defense was that he already knew Mary, they had an argument and he had hit her, thus explaining away the blood on his clothes. 
He painted Mary as a bitter ex-girlfriend. Shockingly, this defence worked. The verdict was not proven and Peter walked free. As those around him welcomed in the new year of 1956, Peter's crimes were escalating still further. Anne Neelands was a 17-year-old factory machinist. On January 2nd, 1956, she was due to attend a local dance with a man that she had met the previous week. The man stood her up and never went to the dance. On 4th of January, a local man out walking his dogs found her partly dressed body on a golf course in East Kilbride. Anne had been badly beaten with an iron bar and sexually assaulted. Peter was on the list of potential suspects. At that time he had been working near the golf course and had fresh scratches on his face. However, he was ruled out of the investigation when his father confirmed Peter's alibi that he had been home at the time of the murder. Nine months later, on 17th of September 1956, a house in Burnside, Lanarkshire, suffered a break-in. The Watts family lived at the house. William, his wife Marion, their 17-year-old daughter Vivian and Marion's sister Margaret Brown. On this particular night, William, an ex-policeman who then ran a bakery, was away on a fishing holiday. During the course of the break-in, all three of the Watts women were shot in the head at close range. The killer stopped to eat some food at the house and made off with several items of jewellery and other valuables. When a home help arrived the following morning, she discovered the bodies. Officers in charge of the investigation again had Peter on their list of suspects. However, suspicion soon fell upon William Watts, particularly when it was discovered that he had several affairs during the course of his marriage. Peter was then convicted on a separate breaking and entering charge and in October 1956 was jailed for 18 months. Meanwhile, William Watts was being blamed for the death of his family and hired a top lawyer, Lawrence Dowdle, to clear his name. Strangely, Lawrence started receiving letters from the incarcerated Peter, who claimed that William was innocent and another unidentified inmate at the prison was responsible for the murders of the Watts family. Peter provided details about the crimes that could only be known by those present. The lawyer, assuming Peter had received this info from a fellow inmate, arranged at least two meetings between Peter and William upon Peter's release from prison. With Peter a free man again, by the end of 1957, his urge to kill soon returned. On December 28, 1957, 17 year old Isabel Cook left her home in Mount Vernon to go to a dance at nearby Uddingston Grammar School. Peter stalked, attacked, sexually assaulted and strangled her on the same footpath where he had attacked a young mother ten years earlier. He then buried Isabel's body in a nearby field. Just a few days later, Peter broke into the home of Peter Smart, his wife Doris and their ten-year-old son Michael. Peter shot all three of them in the head while they were in their beds in the same method as the Watts family before them. Peter then calmly fed the family cat, ate some biscuits before leaving the house with just £20. It is believed that he also took the family car and at one point stopped to give a young policeman a lift to work in it. Despite initially not being connected to these latest murders, eventually his carelessness due to his need for attention proved to be his downfall. With police now connecting the murders of the Smart family with that of the Watts family and Peter's letters from prison about the Watts case, eventually they were starting to hone in on him. When he was then found to be using some of the new £5 notes that Peter Smart had withdrawn from the bank, police had enough evidence to act. In January 1958, the police arrived at Peter's parents' home where Peter told police that he would clear everything up for them once he had told his parents what he had done. He then confessed to the killings of Anne Neelands, Marion Watts, Vivian Watts, Margaret Brown, Isabel Cook and Peter Doris and Michael Smart. After his arrest, Peter took detectives to the spot where he had buried Isabel. 
It is reported that as he guided detectives towards the shallow grave, he calmly stated, I'm standing on her now. He also showed them exactly where he had thrown his guns into the River Clyde. The guns were subsequently recovered and entered into evidence. Despite all of this information, Peter refused to plead guilty, claiming that he had been coerced into making a confession. A trial date was set for May 1958. Peter once again decided to defend himself with a skill that was noted by the judge as being quite remarkable. His defence centred around his claims of being continuously persecuted by police. On direct examination with several of the police officers involved, he accused them of coercing his confession and threatening to implicate his family in the murders if he did not himself confess to them. He also called his mother as a witness, asking her to recall details of a police search of their house and subsequent interviews. Finally, Peter announced that he intended to testify on his own behalf. After taking the oath, he asked questions and then answered them himself. He was then cross-examined by the Crown Prosecutor and at the end of his testimony made a two and a half hour non-stop summation at an astounding average of 200 words per minute. In total, he spent over six hours in the witness box. Despite all of his accusations, the jury took less than three hours to convict him of seven counts of murder. The charge of the murder of Anne Neelands was dropped due to insufficient evidence. Some people believe that the true number of victims could be as high as 20. In particular, there were significant links to the December 1957 shooting of taxi driver Sidney Dunn in Sheffield. Although inconsistencies between witness statements have led to some doubts over Peter's involvement in this, Peter became Scotland's first convicted serial killer and was sentenced to death. After his appeal failed, he ate a final meal of fish and chips with tea and brandy before he was hanged in Barlini Prison on 11th of July 1958. He was 31 years old. It is also reported that his last words were, Turn up the radio and I'll go quietly. That concludes the story of Peter Manuel, the Beast of Birkenshaw. Thank you very much for listening to that one. I'll be looking forward to reading any of your comments on this. Thank you once again for listening to the Crime Reel. Goodbye. The brilliant Martin Comston did a mini TV series in 2016 called In Plain Sight. It's about this story. Thank you once again for listening to the Crime Reel. Goodbye.